And without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce, to uh, present to us on the rise of the native cloud developer, Peter S. Magnuson, uh, Engineering Director at Google. Mic working? Yes, sounds like it. Uh, did I get logged out? Whoa, is that working? Can we bring that up? All right. Um, I appreciate the organizers uh, carefully saying that Peter S. Magnuson. Um, Whenever I do a presentation anywhere, I'm always giving the organizers a hard time of including the, the initial. When Alta Vista came out in 1995, I concluded that an ASCII string that uniquely identifies you in the universe is an important identifier, so I was consistent. So if you do Peter S space S space Magnuson on a search engine, it should just be me on, on the first page. But it doesn't, it's, I, I suppose it should be insisted on the audio because sooner, pretty soon everything everybody says is gonna be transcripted everywhere, right? So. I suppose the searchability in the audio, but it's okay to just say Peter Magnuson in the, in the audio. Um, so, hey guys, um, it's great to be here at ZenCon. I'm Peter Magnuson, I'm an engineer director at uh, Google. I work with cloud platform products. Um, notably, I'm the person most to blame for managing App Engine over the past three years, and to this crowd, I'm, I'm happy to share that I'm also the person most to blame for making PHP an authority, uh, a priority on, on our platform. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I'm able to attend here without being embarrassed at the first question being, why don't you support the biggest uh, web language um, out there? Uh, I put in pause for applause here to see if you guys were awake. All right, thanks. I'm allowed to throw these out apparently, so that's for, uh. and there's two more for over here. Just make sure you guys are awake after lunch. Oh yeah. my. My baseball days are, oh, oh, that's pathetic. That is pathetic. All right, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, 30 days, 30 years of RSI have really ruined my, uh, my, uh, my, my, my choices of becoming a pitcher in the second stage of my life. Um, and if I remember correctly, um, the very first question that I got from the very first crowd of developers that I met um, after joining Google a couple years ago um, was when are we supporting PHP? And in fact, it's long been the number one by far requested feature um, for, for, for App Engine. Um, so now at least the public issue tracker has the term started on it. Um, so it's safe for me to show myself at a PHP event. Uh, and it's great to be getting involved with the PHP community. A significant proportion of the web, of course, as you all know, is PHP. Um, PHP in developers in general are big users of Google APIs. And now with both PHP on App Engine and on our new infrastructure service in Compute Engine, we're also in the business of providing PHP hosting options as well to the community. That jumping there, I need to exercise more, seriously. I got my wind. What I want to talk to you guys a little bit today is what I'll call here uh, cloud native developers. With that I mean developers who are targeting public cloud computing as their target environment. Um, and that's a transition that developers in different languages do at different stages. So Google, as you probably know, runs some pretty large services, search engine, YouTube, Google Maps, Google Mail, so forth. We keep a surprisingly large number of servers busy. For the most part, these services uh, live in the cloud. So Google was a cloud company, of course, before we new to call it um, cloud. So not only are these services operating at, at large scale, we need to deliver them under some pretty serious constraints. Um, they need to be highly available. To give you one measure, Gmail last year delivered 99.98% availability. They need to be fast. Um, our, our average search query response time is roughly a quarter of a second. And we need to have these things run um, in a cost-effective manner. When you're running at scale and when you're primarily um, ad or, or hosting driven, your, your margins need to be defended on your infrastructure side. We need to be distributed, we need to be secure. And whereas when we began doing these things at this scale, not many companies besides ourselves were doing it, 
Today, these characteristics are true of all manner of size companies, notably startups that target large numbers of users, but to various degrees, they apply to everybody who makes a living from some kind of an online service. Now, in opposition to all these environments, <coughs> to all these requirements and demands and constraints, we must, at the end of the day, deliver an agile environment. We need to make it as simple as possible for engineers to innovate and ship. So agility is about focus. It's about being effective rather than efficient. It's about going from, from whiteboard to device. The amount of time and effort it takes from going from an idea to being implemented, um, shipping it to the end users, usually nowadays on some device. And like Andy said this morning, it's about agile delivery, not just agile development. And by the way, it's, it's about being able to unship things too, about being able to test the waters with A-B testing and being able to roll things back in an agile manner when something's wrong or wasn't working as you expected. So when you're building something, be it a website or a mobile application, as you map out the uh, core product logic that you need, then even the simplest idea starts encompassing a wide range of deep technology stacks. We have operational concerns on top of this, provisioning hardware, keeping operating systems maintained and patched, continuous deployment of your own software, scaling it automatically when, tra when traffic levels increase, setting up the tooling, instrumentation to monitor how your service is performing, identifying issues or even potential security breaches. There is also the back-end things that you rely on, the queuing services, sending emails, storing files, storing data in some kind of a persistent storage system. There's managing APIs, remote clients, things like mobile devices or third-party applications. There's all of the optimization services, analytics, compressing static assets, serving them at the edge cache, speeding up page load times. This and more is all extraneous to the code that's unique to your service. The, this other stuff, it's, it's, it's important but it's rarely in and of itself adding value to your business. Not anymore, it used to back when few people could do all those parts well. But now it's a much more level playing field, so you can't distinguish yourself easily on these necessary building blocks. If you or your team are spending time working, understanding, configuring, managing these other parts rather than your core business, that's basically a waste of your time. That is the main challenge to maintaining high agility. So what we at Google and others have done is to break out these generic items, strive to build standalone, multi-tenant service versions of, of everything that's generic. We have dedicated teams internally, world-class experts in technologies like Bigtable, NoSQL storage systems, MapReduce, responsible for making sure that the core shared resources are always running, always tuned for performance, always patched and available to any other development team inside the company that wants to take advantage of them. Now, the idea of shared services isn't exactly a revolutionary one, uh, nor is it ours. Plenty of organizations try some version of this approach. Let's see here. In fact, if, you're, if you'll allow me a, a, a segue, Variations of this overall pattern um, date to the fourth century in, in a parallel I've drawn in the past, um, where I liken the strength of cloud and the transition to cloud public computing as being similar to the nature of the paradigm shift of the creation of bazaars, which of course was um, flavor of marketplaces as a driver of creation of cities and thus the creation of civilization as we know it today. In fact, we can relate a number of the modern benefits to primordial cousins, scalability, Accessibility, economics of scale, security, reliability, simplicity, stickiness. These were all benefits that the individual merchant could derive from setting up shop inside a well-organized market. And certainly the internet in and of itself is something of a bizarre model, um, but it's more of the sort of chaotic jungle. Um, the public cloud platform is, is more of a direct comparison, has trust and curation functionality that comes from targeting a particular community of developers and applying a certain um, set of conventions and, and, and rules and, 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 and standardized services um, and, and is striving to make developers successful for its own good, you know, analogous to how cities have always uh, understood the importance of catering to merchants. So 
a service approach is more likely to work if you make your services as easily as possible to be consumed by other engineers. So a key ingredient to this is consistent API standards. That includes things like well-understood authentication, serialization, discovery and transport standards, so that as a developer I can quickly start coding against an API, even if I haven't specifically worked with it before. For example, many of our PHP APIs now work within a single client library. Um, for example, a common standard for application identity so that every low-level service knows which application is attempting to access it, and in many cases, which user. One of the best ways to accomplish this is to make it easy for the provider of these to build the same set of standards as well. It needs to be easy for the service developer to hook into the same authentication, authorization, billing, transport standards, rate management, so forth. For example, our cloud endpoint service allows third parties to build and expose their APIs using the same authentication, management, discovery, and rate limiting infrastructure that we are using for our own APIs. And this is a bit of a theme today. Um, it seems completely coincidentally, by the way, it's just uh, clearly where the universe is at. Um, App Agility, I hope I pronounced that correctly, that Zen announced today, um, is right in line with this philosophy. So if you're a Zen framework user, I bet you're excited about um, that announcement. And I'm excited to hear specifically that it, App Agility chose to be an opinionated uh, approach to best practices. It's always a harder path to hoe to be highly opinionated as opposed to more free form. So kudos to Zen for, for being determined about that. I think API building in particular is, uh, is a subject area that you really benefit from having an opinionated approach to how the API should be built. Closely related to agility is, is continuous deployment, which again is very much in, 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 in sync with what Andy was talking about this morning. We're an agile process where we minimize the distance between the whiteboard and devices put into a loop. So continuous integration means not only can we make changes more quickly, but we can make them with confidence, even if the person working on it isn't an expert in the, whole, in the software that's, that's impacted by their system. Obviously, you need good tools, revision control, and a CI framework. But ultimately, what this whole philosophy relies upon is testability. At the end of the day, it's only through a harness of robust, good quality tests around your code that give you the confidence to ship that code on demand. In other words, it's not enough that your team can, can write code quickly, but they can write testable code quickly. But how can you do this relying on some third-party piece of software like a database or a message queue or maybe some third-party service like an email gateway to power your service, you need to write tests against it. At first glance, testability seems a little bit at odds with managed services. So how do you test in an isolated, reproducible way a service hosted by someone else? Well, one way, of course, is just to provision resources on each of these services for each of development, testing, staging environment that you need. And, and that works, of course. We do this internally, and there's increasingly some great tooling for, for the DevOps space these days to help you with it, frameworks like Puppet and Chef, for example. But it has a couple of drawbacks. One is isolation. You have to rebuild these environments in some known good state before you can reliably run tests against them. And this is one of the benefits of building services against a well-defined set of API standards like we talked about before, because you're now communicating with things like your email service, your queuing service, your database storage using the same API standards that you can actually mock or emulate these APIs in your development and testing environments. Doing this does, does wonders for testability, because it means that even when your environment is complex, your developers will still have a mock of that environment that they can code against locally. And perhaps more importantly, an environment that they can reliably write tests within, even when they're coding from a beach somewhere. A consistent approach for both producer and consumer on APIs facilitates the creation of local stub services for writing testable code. This is a key value in our App Engine SDK, of course, and now supporting PHP, you can run and test your code fairly decent locally before you stage it in production. And by, by having standardized API and communicating how they work, um, we're also able to work with, with partners and products like Cape Dwarf and AppScale um, that are third-party support for, for App Engine APIs so that you can, one of the reasons that we, that we work with them, um, the obvious reason is obviously that we want to um, dispel fears that people have of artificial lock-in. If you write an application in PHP targeting App Engine um, APIs, you should be able to move that somewhere else. But a more subtle and just as important reason is to provide options for developer community and how to develop, because you can easily develop App Engine apps on, on, on Cape Dwarf um, or, or on AppScale. Um, when we announced PHP, I think uh, uh, AppScale 
uh, put together PHP support uh, uh, pretty fast on their environment. So that, that was some thoughts around agility and agile um, delivery. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, containers. And for those of you not familiar with, 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 uh, with App Engine, um, it's part of a, of a, a, a um, dual platform strategy that, that Google has on, on, um, uh, on, on cloud computing. So we have a platform as a service offering um, called App Engine. I think App Engine launched before that, that term was invented. And then we have a um, infrastructure as a service offering in the form of, uh, of Compute Engine. Um, here I'm primarily going to talk about, um, about App Engine. Um, everything that Andy talked about earlier today about their deployment stuff are things that we're working with Zen to support obviously on, on Compute Engine as well. Um, so to talk about some of the pros and cons of, of the kind of containers we have on a platform as a service, I want to um, walk through the sort of history of how, how, how people s serve code, how, how w websites and, and, um, and apps work. Um, so you might start out hosting a service, putting it on a server, give it some power, connect it to the internet. Um, it's under your desk or in your, in, in, in your garage if you're a startup, you have to start in a garage. Your next step up from that is you pretty quickly realize you need a bit more security, a bit more resiliency than uh, the environment under your desk uh, provides. You instead rent some space in a data center, uh, move it there. Uh, that environment provides you great things like redundant power, cooling, uh, redundant networking, physical security. So now you have some of the redundant aspects of the, of the physical environment of your server. At some point, you need more than one server, um, both for scalability, also for resiliency, but also for different test and deploy and staging issues. And at this point, you probably want to take the step to, to virtualizing those servers rather than running code directly on the machine. We run it inside virtual machines, which in turn run on the physical machines. Gives us benefits like resource bin packing, reduces management administration work. VMs are easier to handle than physical boxes. We can snapshot them. We can run some VM snapshot on several machines in a cluster. If we need more machines um, to serve more users, our cloud provider can find some spare machines, deploy the image, connect it. Using VMs also means that we provide consistency for execution environment, even if the underlying hardware is, is a little different. And of course, it makes a great isolation container for, for third parties. Um, such as Google with Compute Engine to allow many developers to run their own code securely on shared infrastructure. VMs are great, but there are a couple of challenges. If you look at what you need to put inside these VMs, and especially if you look at like a language specific environment like you're a PHP developer, um, here's a simplified diagram showing the sort of things that you might find on a typical setup. You obviously have an operating system, you got something like Nginx, web server, application code. Um, and a VM gives you the freedom to install exactly the parts that you want for that service, but you still need tools and procedures for, for managing all of that. So that brings another problem with this model. Um, and that is simply that there's considerable overhead that comes with, with running all of this stuff, in particular RAM. Um, even if your application is very small, you need to consume at least one whole small compute unit uh, if you have to be available, and every, all the components that you're using um, has some sort of a footprint, and you need to pay for that. Um, they also take a little while to configure and set up. Uh, even if you've tuned them to the hilt and get them up in 20 seconds each, um, that's still kind of slow for responsiveness. Real world environment, you're, you're probably hard pressed to, in, operator, in operating environments, see something much better consistently than minutes to several minutes. Um, slow boots is problematic when you have dynamic traffic. It becomes harder to make sure you got a service that's always provisioning just the right amount of computing for the load that it's supposed to handle. Once your service is operating at, at gigantic scale, this problem is actually simpler from the sense of resource provisioning. Gigantic scale brings some other issues, but uh, the, the law of large numbers starts working in your favor. So for example, it's fairly straightforward for us to understand um, resource requirements for YouTube over a diurnal variation because no particular hit uh, video is really gonna move the needle on global scale. If your service is, is smaller, it's a problem, one that's usually resolved by over-provisioning, which is expensive. So how can you fix this? Well, how a pass goes about addressing this issue is to note that a vast majority of PHP applications have 
a large amount of, of generic things in common, standard OS, servers, SQL, interpreter. You might configure things a little differently, but most PHP web applications run largely the same software. And in fact, really, it's the execution space inside the interpreter and its memory that needs to be unique to your particular application. So for web applications, we have a lot to gain from switching to essentially a process-level virtual machine. So here the boundary between what's managed by you and what is managed by the cloud provider is much tighter. Exactly how we do this will vary depending on the services, but it's not uncommon to have services where the OS server and core libraries are actually shared resources between different applications. When we use these smaller, more lightweight, more constrained containers, we immediately get a couple of benefits. First, as a developer, we have now far less to manage. We don't need to worry about installing or configuring anything. Application servers, operating systems, all of that's managed for us. Secondly, we see much better efficiency and utilization of our underlying hardware. We can bin pack these processes uh, much more efficiently. In the case of App Engine, we are currently serving over three million different applications on, on the same large cluster. It's a fairly large cluster, but, but still. Um, thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, it makes our applications more responsive to changing traffic conditions in a cost-effective way. In fact, we can scale up dramatically um, in a matter of seconds. But this shared approach also allows us to move out of, from a fairly complex, hard to manage system into a multi-tenant environment. So that moves a huge part of the attack surface from a security point of view out of the equation. I want to deep dive a little bit on security. There are lots of different kind of benefits with going um, for these, these kind of computation environments, but I want to emphasize security. Um, there are no ports to, to uh, probe the container on. You can't send packets directly to it, things like that. Um, there's no local file system. Um, obviously, your app is completely separated from other apps, but what's important is that it interacts with the outside world through very well-defined interfaces. So worth noting, for example, is that App Engine's auth system makes it really easy to partition off part of your app's URL space in such a way that it can only be accessed by authenticated admins of the app. And there's nothing that you can do as a developer to bypass that. Um, authenticating using your Google accounts. So, for example, that's a great way to run something like PHP My Admin in a very secure way. So unsafe functionality disabled by default. The same security team that scrutinizes all of Google's other high value products has applied its expertise to PHP with the aim of producing the securest possible configuration. Um, and this was actually one of the hardest phases of the project of adding PHP um, to Google App Engine. So, and we're security conscious across our features as, as we add them. Um, one example is that we post-launch um, added the ability to import code from Google Cloud Storage, which is useful for various templating libraries and things like that. But we only allow importing from buckets that you've nominated in your php.ini file, which is your, a configuration file. So there's no way in the, in the code to, to, do, to, um, to load in code. It's, there's no way for programmatically load in code from a bucket um, that is not named um, in a configuration file. Now, let's see. So back to burstability. Um, here's a real world example um, of this in action. This is a traffic graph from an App Engine application uh, running PHP. It's a fairly ordinary PHP site. This was actually one of the first, if not the first, sort of real world. PHP sites um, at Google that was hosted on App Engine. A uh, senior executive at, 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 at Google promised um, um, this, this company that, oh yeah, we can help you with this launch and we got a 48 hour notice. Can you support you know, this company doing a big PHP launch? And we said, are you serious? We haven't, this is beta, we haven't even opened it, for, it's still being whitelisted. Um, so, um, so we scrambled, well it was a busy weekend. Um, but this is a pretty typical sort of end result that we've seen before in other languages that we supported, Java and Python, and, and here it's with a pretty ordinary, uh, ordinary in a sense, a pretty straightforward, nothing strange PHP site. And it was very, getting very little um, live traffic. Um, but then suddenly there was a, a press event, it drew a lot of uh, broad media, and all of a sudden it, it jumps by multiple, multiple orders of magnitude, um, up to about 60 queries per second, that's about that's equivalent to a load level of about five million queries, uh, five million hits a day. Now, 60 QPS isn't terribly challenging. This was a very challenging thing for, 
for this company, they didn't quite know how to easily migrate from a single server to, to handle this peak, and they didn't know if they were going to get 20 QPS or 500 QPS. Um, but we have customers on App Engine peaking above 50,000 QPS. So yes, you can, you can now write a PHP app for a 50K QPS on this framework. Um, though if, if you require a lot of uh, SQL backend writes on, on every page visit, you might need to get a little creative. Um, the, the near SQL data store will, will handle it just fine. Um, we have customers with six terabyte of dedicated and distributed memcache as well. So that's no problem either. Um, so I think one of the things that we're doing here uh, and that we look forward to working with you guys is, is usher in a lowering of the threshold of how difficult it is to build and run uh, PHP sites that scale um, to, to, to really serious levels. Now, the site owner didn't actually realize that this had happened a few hours afterwards when he checked the graphs. There was no alerts, no warnings, nothing like that. It just, it just did its thing. Um, so this just shows how lightweight compute containers can be hugely advantageous and the building services that both need to be responsive and cheap. And the reason for that is that because the containers are standardized, we can literally allocate uh, inside the cluster new containers in, in, in less than a second. So literally in the time that it would take you to load the entire page, we're spinning up um, whatever, resources, whatever resources you need. So it's not just the ability of going from very small to very high, it's, it's really the second derivative of the curve um, that, is the real, that is real measure. You know, how many timeouts are you getting um, when you're hitting a, a really crazy curve like that? Um, and the, so it gives you that, that derivative, but it also, um, to emphasize the difference between a, 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 a platform as a service as opposed to paying for VMs for this is that you're only paying for the, the surface area under that graph. Um, you're only paying for the resource that you're using. So you do not have to pay for computational resources uh, standing by. And the reason that works as a provider is that we have hundreds of thousands of developers writing millions of apps. So no single app is, is really gonna move the needle very much. That's not entirely true because we're beginning to have some, some applications that are, uh, um, if, if, if you throw up a 50 QPS app and start running that, then that'll actually get our attention. So you can't put 100 of those without us noticing it. Um, but by and large, um, there are all resources available for, for, for any sort of realistic thing that you're gonna need. And so we don't have to charge for it um, being provisioned and ready for you because the provisioning um, um, can be shared. So those are the things that those small generic containers boil down to, and we've spent a lot of work introducing PHP into this model, right, which is essentially what we've done, is to um, support the, um, the, the Zen core interpreter in this environment and adding support for the App Engine APIs and adding support for, um, for that in the SDK. It g gives a scalable environment, uh, very low cost to idle. Uh, in fact, the free tier on App Engine is quite, uh, is quite generous, so you can write a PHP app um, that essentially runs for free if it doesn't get too much activity. Um, makes it easy to do multilingual apps in the sense of that parts of it are maybe in Java and parts of your app may be in Go for different reasons, and it's fairly easy to make, especially with new support for modules. Um, we believe it's very secure, uh, and in particular, you don't have to worry so much about the security, the, m very much of the security things that you would need to care about if you're running your own PHP site is managed by us. Um, and I believe it's easy to build for and easier to own as well. So it's, it's no secret that, that speed matters when it comes to building a successful online property. Um, a few years ago, we published a study where we deliberately slowed down the speed at which our search results were being presented to a small subset of users. What we found as we slowed down page rendering times to a user even slightly is that it translated into a measurable reduction in the number of searches that users would then come back and perform. So other services and other companies have obviously done similar experiments with similar results. Speed matters. So it's actually the third of Google's 10 core philosophies. Um, I should be able to rattle them all off, but I, I can't, so I looked this one up. Um, fast is better than slow, is one of the core philosophies. Um, we try to keep core principles simple, so easy to remember them. Um, from what we've shipped um, at Google as, 
as a, has long been a company obsessed with, with speed, from online properties like Search and Gmail to technologies like V8 uh, and our Blink rendering engine in Chrome, um, the Spidey protocol, which is the next generation replacement for HTTP. Um, we invest in these because we know it's not enough only to require products to be fast, but we now use site speed and the performance um, as one of several factors in page rank, and we've shared that publicly. We know that sites that perform responsibly will yield better experiences for end users, and they will prefer a speedy site over a slow site, other factors being equal. But delivering a speedy response is, is difficult, especially when you need to do it uh, globally. First of all, as a developer, if you're building a front-end web service, you have to work to optimize your experience for the web, things like concatenating CSS, spiriting images, deferring JavaScript execution. While we are gladly some distance from the time when you might need to rewrite different versions of your sites for different browsers, and hopefully it's gonna stay that way for a while now, certainly there's something to be said for optimizing your front-end code for different devices. And then perhaps most importantly, there's the importance of being able to deliver this highly optimized experience to your end users from the server or servers that it's sitting on to the user's browser. And there's a lot of things you can do around machine tuning, caching, network optimization. That is, you can do that to make your service faster. Similarly, increasingly, everyone on the web becomes a global brand. Your customer can be anywhere. Um, the first implication of this, if you're running the operations of something, is that there's never a good time to take down your service. When you're running an online service and your audience is global, then you need to have that service running all the time. But that's really hard to do. And some kind of scheduled maintenance is inevitable for most configurations. Even if your own code doesn't need to be updated, there's always patches to operating systems, application servers, web servers, tools, et cetera. And of course, the machine that these rely on will inevitably fail from time to time. So for us, reliability is enormously important. We invest heavily and globally redundant tools and teams spread across time zones that are charged with making sure these services stay online. Internally, we've set a standard that is sometimes called meteorite level reliability, which means that even if, a, even if something uh, hits, something destructive hits the data center uh, that a service is operating out of, um, that service per se should, should keep running and ideally as few users as possible should notice and if they do notice, it should be very, very intermittent. Um, in practice, alien attacks aren't likely. It's more likely things like wildlife getting into cooling systems, backhoes turning over power lines, somebody pressing the wrong button somewhere. Um, but the principle is the same. Your underlying system should not depend on any particular piece of hardware all the way up to a single data center. So uh, a multi-tenant system like App Engine can be built from the ground up to be multi-data center. So we've shared publicly um, that our storage systems that underlie it, um, that are the, um, uh, where you would commit any changes to, are resilient to losing more than one data center. So if you're, you don't do, if you're using the storage system that comes with API as a PHP developer on App Engine, that's all you need to do to be resilient. You will not, you will not lose that data. Um, in the, in if, if there is an outage, then your system will, well, your, your app will, will restart somewhere else um, pretty quickly. We're not um, immune to doing stupid things that bring down our systems in various ways. Um, nobody is. Um, but interestingly enough, when, when we have had uh, 18 months ago or 20 months ago, we had uh, a multi-hour hour outage that impacted several uh, a large proportion of developers. Um, but interestingly, none of those developers really had to do anything to get their apps back up. There was no loss of data. Um, there was no corruption. It, it was an issue of it being unavailable, but then it was back up. Um, the second implication, if your customers can come from anywhere in the world, is at some point your performance is going to be impacted by, by a fundamental constraint that you can't change. That's the speed of light. Um, there's not a lot, lot to do about it. Um, Larry famously has said at Google that he's a real, little frustrated that we can't fix that. Um, and he's open for any suggestions. Um, for, for how to get around that. But if you're building a global framework and if you do the math on how long time it takes, um, even on the best possible conditions for, for packets to make it around the globe, uh, this, this does impact things. So uh, this becomes, of course, more acute when you, when you have to respond to the user. You need to shuttle back and forth between different services to actually deliver a response to an end user. Um, on average, uh, I think at one point we published that the average Google search query 
travels 1,500 miles um, to get an answer back. But what that means is that when you are building your systems and then you're comparing different environments for you to be running your systems on, you need to take a global perspective and a system level perspective of benchmarking of what the, what, what the performance is. Um, in particular, um, Google has quite an extensive um, network of, its, of our own that we route things to as soon as you get into it. So if you're, if you're running something on a, on, on, on Compute Engine or App Engine um, at Google, uh, the, end, the end user will come in through one of our, um, our edge, edge gateways, and then from there on, it's routed in our internal network. So a great network is a heart of your system's performance. And the picture behind me is a networking room from one of our data centers in, in Oregon. In fact, our, our newest networking rooms uh, would have been fairly well-sized data centers in and of themselves uh, not that far, not, not that long ago. Um, it's, it's, so what's between your data centers um, is as important as what's inside them. And I think this is the, one of the single least observed or measured things when people look and compare with um, different options for where to run things and how to build things. Um, in our case, we're the first and only non-ISP company to own submarine cables, for example. Um, we, led the cons we, led a we led the consortium that built a Unity cable um, across the Pacific um, with several terabits, terabit uh, bandwidth between the US and Japan. Um, and we have a network that spans a globe. We peer directly with virtually all major ISPs worldwide. We can hand our traffic directly to, uh, to the end ISP for the best performance. So by, by putting um, public cloud computing options within our, within our systems, and in App Engine's case, we have a cluster of data centers in Europe and we have a cluster of data centers in North America, then if you're getting into that environment, you're actually not routing on the public internet to get to it, you're actually routing um, inside uh, uh, fiber that's largely owned by us and managed by us. And it's also one of the more <coughs> advanced networks you, you'll find. Um, for example, we've been running uh, global uh, SDN backbone for, for over two years, um, open, po open flow powered uh, backbone, connecting all of our data centers worldwide. That improves cost and performance and scalability. Hello, there we go. Um, and as you may imagine, when running as many servers as we do, any efficiency gain we can translates into large savings, obviously. Um, but I wanted to emphasize um, a particular aspect of it. Um, it's in Google's, Google's culture to really care about being green. And if this doesn't matter to you, to you, you can tune out and check Twitter um, for, this, for this section. Um, so we design and build our own data centers from server design and up. When you do that top to bottom um, design exercise, it turns out that there's a lot of interesting things you can do that impact cooling and power consumption. So as a result, our data centers are roughly 50, use roughly 50% less energy uh, than what's typical in the industry. Uh, if you're familiar with the space, we report a comprehensive trailing 12-month power usage effectiveness number of 1.11 um, across all of our data centers in all seasons, including all sources of, of overhead. Um, to take an extreme but, but familiar example of what this translates into, Customers who switch from running a local email server's servers, uh, server on a box in their office and then migrates corporate email to, to Gmail um, decrease environmental impact by, of their email system um, by up to 98%. So mega data centers are, are really crazy efficient, right? This is industrial revolution all over again, right? Large factories are really efficient. Large data centers, when, when you can break it down into what they're able to produce, are just crazy efficient. Uh, we had the first data centers to receive iOS 14.001 certification. Um, in order to accelerate um, options of clean energy access, we financed over 250 megawatts of new wind power. And whatever we can't get rid of in terms of buying um, renewable energies or efficiencies, um, we offset. So Google is a 100% carbon neutral company. So anything that you run, any computation that you run uh, any service that you run that's running on, on our cloud services, we do all the auditing and all the math to make sure that that's completely carbon neutral. So if you care about that, then that's something that you should be asking any vendors and partners that you work with.
But as well as, um, but as, well as global edge caching and simply raw speed, um, there's another benefit when building a highly performant cloud services, and that's predictability. And I, and I wanted to bring that up because that's another one of these problems similar to um, what the network performance is and environmental effects is. Um, that's a little unintuitive at first and isn't that focused on. So in a nutshell, what we discovered is that it's not enough for the average speed of an operation of a service, uh, like saving to a database or adding to a queue to be fast. Um, what's, more, what's more important is that the, that the lowest speed um, is also fast. What we find when we go and measure this in many services is that the long tail of queries is, is, is actually quite large. Um, let's see. So if we look at, for example, uh, yeah, that's, that's and that's. So this graph shows the concept. So if you measure your site, um, or if you measure whatever hosting option or technology that you're working on over a long period of time, um, you wanna plot the distribution uh, of response time. And the, and the tail to the right is your tail latency, and that's the one that can be really tricky to get rid of. Um, and it's a problem, even if it's like one in a hundred is slow, it's a problem because these things get, get aggregated. We're all PHP developers here, so, so I'll take a PHP example. If we, if we take a simple case of a page loading in WordPress, um, then on a, on a typical, I think a, a vanilla install of WordPress, um, we're talking about something like 20 uh, MySQL queries. And what I understand, and I'm not a WordPress expert, so throw tomatoes if I'm completely off base here. My understanding is that a typical full-scale WordPress site will be looking at something like 50 or 100 uh, MySQL queries uh, on average per page. And of course, if you're having a strict dependency on getting answers to all of those and your internal service um, has a tail latency issues, then you get these quantization effects that sure, it might just be one in, a, one in 500 that have weird characteristics, but that will translate into one in five page visits having weird characteristics. Um, so you really wanna look at the distribution of, of the, you wanna measure the whole system at the end of the day as it's viewed by the customer, and you wanna measure that a lot of times so you can get a distribution of what, what, what your customers um, experience. Now, the reason that we might call this a cloud problem is that um, if not managed correctly, um, this problem can really start to manifest on, on shared services like shared compute ca containers and shared networking. And if you start running in an environment with lots of different shared services um, in your shared environment, then these things can all add up in, in, in different ways, uh, which means that eliminating these uh, infrequent slow events uh, is crucial to, to ensuring performance services. Um, you know, if you were to listen in on, on Google engineer conversations, um, a surprising amount of them are around ways of dealing with these um, tail latencies, especially when systems start running, start running at scale. Um, so, so you wanna be testing these things at scale. So if you're running for a certain demand right now and you expect over the next you know, two years to be 10Xing the demand, you might wanna do some benchmarks at that scale to see what way you're building it's gonna hold up to it. Um, and this in turn is, is one of the reasons we've invested very heavily in, in network and compute infrastructure the last 15 years, and particularly the last uh, several years, um, because we've discovered that quality of service management at the compute level and at the network level propagate up. Uh, historically, we would have been building systems that were built on top of subsystems that were a lot more best effort oriented. Um, and that works fine for, for batch uh, processes. Doesn't work so good if you're, if you're serving something. And as more and more businesses move to the cloud, more and more engineers begin developing for the cloud, um, we think that the awareness of this issue of predictability is gonna become more important in the minds of developers when choosing where and how to run their code. And they're gonna start asking tough questions of people like ourselves and, and other providers about things like network provisioning and CPU contention. So, Let's recap a little bit um, this notion of the cloud native developer. So cloud native developers are going to be agile by building on services, using common API designs and patterns, rapidly building quality testable code, focusing on the parts of their application that really matter. Cloud native developers are gonna be cost efficient by using lightweight compute containers that can match demand effectively. And cloud native developers are gonna build fast services with a global reach because they will care about the network that they're building on top of and they will care about the totality um, of the delivered service. 
Now, before I sign off with another one of my famous segues, um, for several years now we've been working to externalize a lot of the infrastructure, uh, including the lightweight containers. I talked about uh, about these, um, and of course, one of these services is Google App Engine. We internally use quite a lot for our own products as well as for third parties you might have heard of, like SongPop and Snapchat. So in May this year, uh, to recap, uh, for those of you who missed the movie, we announced PHP on Google App Engine at I.O., um, allowing you to run your PHP services uh, inside our, our, our data centers. Uh, it was a limited preview of the platform. We were only make, able to make it a hand, to, available to, um, to a handful of developers. It's a pretty big hand. I think we limited preview to a few thousand. Um, to, today, however, just in time for ZenCon, we're announcing that we're, we've dropped the whitelist. So uh, we saved this for, for ZenCon. Uh, so now anyone can sign up for PHP on App Engine and get started right away. Um, so it's now on open sign up, and I think we rolled out the uh, blog posting at 1.30 p.m. Uh, uh, precisely um, to match with this. In addition, uh, we're giving away $2,000 credit to every ZenCon attendee uh, for both App Engine and for Google Cloud Platform in general. So you can get that at our booth. Um, if you're a developer, cloud native or otherwise, interested in trying out App Engine or any other part of our platform, we have a full session on that, um, information there, uh, as well as several members of App Engine developer team on hand at the Google booth over the next couple of days. Um, at the core of our implementation, obviously, we run the Zen Core Interpreter, uh, and while most of our modifications are specific to App Engine. We're finding fixes and improvements um, that, that we are starting to contribute um, upstream. So we're very excited about being an active member of the core PHP development community. Um, if you're interested in what we're up to, please come have a chat. I'll be here for questions right after, right after I've done uh, one of my random segues. So there's actually no evidence that Watson ever said anything like this. Um, the beauty of the internet is that myths are easy to kill. He, he didn't say, say this in 1948, as far as can be told, but if he had said it in 1948, it would have been notable for two reasons. So first of all, it actually held true for 10 years. So it wasn't until well into the 50s that um, the, um, the sixth computer was sold. Um, second, and here comes my prediction, um, it's about to become true again. So my prediction, which I made originally in 2010 at a talk at an IEEE event looking out to 2020, and I still stand by it, is that, quote, there is a world market for maybe five clouds. So I think we will end up with, because of the economies of scale and the difficulties of the technologies involved, that our notion of computer is going to change. Um, our notion of cloud is going to change. We're not going to think of it as cloud. Um, I don't know if you're, any of you are fans of Chuck Lore, but he has these vanity cards um, here's my uh, eye chart, and of course I'm supposed to just have that for three seconds and you need to have DVR to, to be able to read it, right? Um, but I'll read it. So thinking of cloud computing is equivalent to an electrical utility which keeps recurring by visionary talkers, and that always annoys me, uh, because that focus on the cheap production of a standardized um, commodity, is, that's, that's the whole motorized horse comparison. Um, I think what's going on is much more um, fundamental. We don't use the phrase personal computer when we talk about tablet, smartphone, set-top box, or Google Glass. Uh, nor do I think in 2020 are we going to use the phrase cloud. We'll be talking about something else entirely, something that today we don't even know what it is. But we know what the contours will be, because we know the main agents will still be humans. Humans don't change much. We know it will be about making money, socializing, being entertained, and 10 billion people, because we're going to cap around 10 billion people, struggling for a role and a voice in the first truly planetary medium. It will change our society in a manner like no previous single revolution, instead bringing the incremental revolutions of printing, press, telegraphy, photography, telephony, radio, video, computer, cell phone, and internet um, into a single digital realm. And I think we are all, we will be telling our grandchildren, all of us here, that we were here when this was all being created. And that's my presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs>